Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, my name is uh, John Warwick. I'm the executive director here at Hillel at FIU. Uh, and we have two very special guests this evening, Lance Bass and Michael Turchin, who are going to talk to us a little bit about their role uh, that religion played in their lives from childhood uh, to now being parents of their own, and give us some insight into their blended family. We have some, some of the family here, too, as well. Uh, this is part of our speaker series, which uh, for those who have joined us in the past know, we've had everyone from Jody Sweeten to Amari Stoudemire and Ray Allen and so many others. The programs we run at Hillel at FIU are really like no other program in the nation. Our goal is to help our Jewish students become well-rounded leaders in the Miami Jewish community and to create allies with the non-Jewish communities in the fight against anti-Semitism and all forms of hate. Mm -hmm. We've done everything uh, from partnering with Jubilon to place billboards around Miami calling out anti-Semitism, to inviting the mayor to speak at FIU's Diversity Day, one of our partners today, about how the religious community came together after the Surfside tragedy. I'd also like to thank FIU's Office of Social Justice and Inclusion and Pride Center for their partnership today. Um, and now to thank our sponsors, I'd like to introduce our board chair, Lisa Gerald. Lisa. I think I would learn, I know, I'm on mute. Got it, 2022. Hi everyone, as John said, I'm Lisa Gerald. I'm board chair of Hillel at FIU. And I have the best job because I get to say thank you tonight to everyone. Thank you to John Olga and the students of Hillel at FIU for giving me such an amazing program to promote in our community. We've come a long way in a few years here at Hillel, being a large public university in a town experiencing unprecedented growth. One of the things I'm most proud of is programs like this that connect students to the community, educate the masses, and raise funds for Hillel at FIU, allowing us to provide fantastic programming year round. <laughs> I'd like to thank our sponsors, our platinum sponsors, Alan Sokol, All Before Dinner, Don Knows Tequila, Israel Bonds, Nadine and Sydney Pertnoy, and Joan and Glenn Rosansky. I'd also like to thank our gold sponsors, Al Halal Law, Jordan Davis, Dina and Keith Golden, Susan R. Hampton, CPA, Jonathan Carlin, Alexander and Vanessa Menkez Orlovsky, Aaron Resnick, and Alicia and Robert Rosa. For community members joining, we'll be raising funds during Hillel's Global Giving Week, May 9th through 13th, where gifts up to $10,000 will be matched dollar for dollar. We're gonna put a link in the chat where you can pledge now and someone from Hillel will contact you during Global Giving Week. And thank you in advance for all of your support. Finally, I wanna thank the Greater Miami Jewish Federation, Hillel International and FIU for their ongoing support in all that we do. And thanks of course to Lance and Michael for joining us tonight. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, we've also uh, invited uh, folks from Honeymoon <laughs> Israel uh, program, Miami's first uh, inaugural uh, trip uh, <laughs> on Honeymoon Israel. And now to tell us a little bit about that, uh, Rabbi Adam Gadia from uh, Base Miami. Um, thank you so much for having us here. Um, yeah, it's an honor to share a little bit about this Honeymoon Israel experience that we just came back from. Uh, it's an amazing program that tries to bring bring couples where there's a Jewish partner um, into an immersive experience in Israel um, to kind of allow people to explore what what Judaism live what Judaism can mean in their homes. Um, it was a very, very interesting trip that that really tries to reach out to unfortunately what's categorized as couples on the fringe of Jewish communal life, like couples that don't necessarily have entranceway or access points into into Jewish communal experiences. Um, and actually, so it was an amazing experience. I'm happy to share more about it. Feel free to reach out to me. You can learn more about Honeymoon Israel through Federation and through the Young Leadership Division of Greater Miami Jewish Federation. Um, but I actually want to take this opportunity to share a little thought, which is that we're on the eve of Passover. Passover is coming up on Friday night and Saturday night. We start the eight-day festival. And... Um, and it's really a remarkable holiday. And so much of, of what, it, it's like really like the, the wholeness of the Jewish struggle is in, is in Passover and like how we struggle with it and how we deal with it. And, and what it really shows and what it signals is this concept of struggling with the ancient traditions and the antiquity of our peoplehood and also modernity. And like, how do we grapple and be in both of those spaces? How do we preserve and hold on to the beauty and wisdom and depth of our traditions that are rooted in thousands of year olds of tradition? And also how do we live in the world where it evolves and changes and grows and develops in the way in which it does? Um, and that's like, the, that's so much of the struggle of the Jewish people. Um, and there are Jews and there are Jewish communities where they're very much 
rigid and leaning into the preservation of those ancient concepts and those traditions and are very scared of modernity and evolution and growth and development of, of people and society and times. Um, but there's also a tremendous huge world of the Jewish community that's very much embracing that and figuring out how to navigate that and how to welcome people of diverse backgrounds and of different blended families and faith traditions and sexualities and all different sorts of people that are trying to figure out what it means to be in the world and how to navigate that. Um, Honeymoon Israel is just one program and one example of how the Jewish community is evolving and growing and figuring out how, would he, how do we preserve all of the, the beauty and wonder of the Jewish tradition and also grow the way the world is growing. Um, Honeymoon Israel, BASE is the program that I run, Moisha House, One Table, Repair the World, all these organizations, the Young Leadership Division, the Greater Miami Jewish Federation, there are so many programs and opportunities and um, and avenues out there for people to explore and continue to figure out what does it mean to be Jewish today? And what does that look like? And, and what do those homes look like? And what do those traditions look like? And, and how does this all kind of unfold in the eternal telling of this story of the Jewish people? Um, so Michael and Lance, thank you for being here and, and sharing a little bit of your Torah and your story and, and how all of this resonates and lives in your homes. And um, I really, I, I look forward to, uh, to being here with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, all right, which brings us to our, our conversation here. Um, is that working? Yes, it is. Hi. Um, Hi, everybody. I'm hitting a lot of buttons at once, so <laughs> there we go. Um, that was the, the perfect segue, because that's what we're, we're talking about here today, is, is uh, the, the blended family, the, the uh, childhood, and at, at some point, Michael, your, your mom is here. We definitely want to hear about what it's like when the families first met. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, let's start, Lance, let's start with you. Tell us a bit about your childhood and the role religion played and religious culture played in, in your life growing up. Yeah, I mean, as a kid, our whole life was based around the Southern Baptist Church. Uh, I grew up in a really small town of 2,000 people, and we didn't really look outside that town. Uh, you know, it was all about what was happening, you know, within the little town. We knew everyone's business. It felt very safe. It's definitely one of those towns you didn't lock your doors. Um, but, you know, I, it also it also scared me as a kid, too, because I knew since I was five years old that I was gay. And everything that I heard, you know, growing up in that town uh, was that I was evil uh, and people like me were evil. So, um, you know, in one way it felt very safe and I loved the way that I was raised, but and there was this kind of secret in the background of me that felt very not wanted um, and, uh, and kind of scared for people to figure out who my true self was. Right, and not, not to jump ahead, but you know, when, I mean, it was, it was national news uh, you know, covers of magazines uh, when you came out. Was there people from your childhood who were supportive that you were surprised about or, or, or what, what was the reaction? I mean, I was very surprised with the reaction. You know, it was 2006. So it was, a, although it was only you know, like 20 years ago, uh, it still was just a different time for the LGBT community. Um, you know, coming out, especially in entertainment was a death sentence, you know, I mean, you could have no career and be gay. That's what we were always told and shown. I mean, we all saw what happened to Ellen DeGeneres when she came out, she got fired and just everyone turned their back on her. Uh, so when I came out, um, uh, it was very scary. Just one, because I was outed. So I didn't really, it wasn't on my own terms. Uh, they gave me 48 hours to say, look, we're writing this story with or without you. You know, do you want to tell it with us? Uh, and I decided, okay, I, I need to say something. And, and, uh, and that's why I chose People Magazine to tell my story. Uh, but I, I didn't know what to expect. I expected the Ellen treatment. So I kind of disappeared for a while and didn't want to read anything about my coming out story. Uh, and it wasn't until I came up from air that I saw the clips of the Letterman's and Leno's of the world and how they responded to it. And it was amazing. It was just so overwhelmingly positive. And even my friends and family from back home in Mississippi were just overwhelmingly supportive. Um, I just was not expecting that. Um, and it just made me feel incredible. Wow. And, and, and Michael, let's, let's turn to you. Um, you know, the Jewish community in Miami Beach growing up, they also know everybody's business, I, I would oh, assume. Yeah. 
Um, but you might have locked your doors. I don't know. If, I don't know if the doors were unlocked. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, <laughs> well, with my hand. Tell us about your your childhood. Um, yeah, I guess on like the flip that flip side, um, you know, I grew up in Miami Beach. It's a big town. Um, very Jewish. Um, yeah, I was like uh, growing up, we were, you know, we I was basically friends with mostly Jewish, you know, Jewish other kids. I we lived in a very Jewish neighborhood, although like we weren't, you know, overtly religious, my family, you know, I guess we were reformed Jews, you know, we celebrate the ma the major holidays and whatnot. But I, my experience like with Judaism, it was way more of like for us, at least my family, like a community. We, you know, we, I went to Hebrew school on like every Wednesdays, I was in the bestie program. I, uh, you know, my family was part of a Havara and we would go on these, you know, vacations with all these other families. Um, all the time, other Jewish families. So it was, so it played a big role in kind of this like my life and not necessarily the, the hard religious part of it. It was more of the sense of community that I feel like, especially with Jews and Judaism that's created. Kind of like, you know, how Italians are just super big with community. I feel like Jewish people are the exact same way, kind of uplift one another and kind of, you know, support one another. So it was a huge community that I grew up with that was, I mean, overwhelmingly, it was very supportive. Yeah, and I, that's a good point. Like community is the thing that, you know, that drew me, you know, to religion and organized religion. But once you're, you know, out uh, gay, you kind of get, I mean, my whole family was kicked out of their churches. Um, I was not welcomed back to any churches. And I think the biggest downfall for that and that hurt the most was that loss of community. Um, I didn't have that support system anymore. Um, and if it, when your community just turns their back on you, it is a, I mean, it, it really burns. It burns, especially for someone so young. Um, so, yeah, I think that is the biggest thing that um, really disappointed me was just losing yeah. that, that feel of community. Yeah. Um, and I will say it's it's a very typical Miami uh, Jewish person a thing to do to say, oh, I'm not really that I'm not really that Jewish. And then list 10 things that you have. Yeah, right exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I did all these other things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, has, um, but you mentioned that the community has um, has that changed, Lance, for you? Like, you know, you know over the years has the community been more open more welcoming um i i can tell like the pope has 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 said yeah. the right things here and there. <laughs> yeah he said some great things but he's also you know kind of contradicted himself a few times yeah uh but no i mean i found my community and my friends and family uh you know my relationship with god is is my own personal one now um you know as a baptist i grew up on the teachings of jesus christ and uh, to me, Jesus was a great man and had the best outlook on what we are supposed to be doing. So I learned, uh, you know, because I studied the Bible a lot. I've read it, you know, way too many times and I, I know it, you know, front to back. And the thing that I realized was all the teachings of Jesus were exactly what we should be living. And the rest of it, I felt, was just very... Um, you know, man-made, and you could just tell the parts that were changed, and uh, you know, to really, you know, yeah, basically just, hate people. Well, to shape a culture yeah. that benefited certain people and not other people. So yeah. once I started realizing, like, okay, I should just really just follow the teachings of what you know Jesus did, it really changed my outlook mm -hmm. on everything, and I found like-minded people, and that was the community. Uh, that I created. Um, no, I don't feel very welcome in the church, even at this point. And yes, there are some really great churches out there that are, you know, affirming. Oh, yeah. and, uh, Especially and, here in Los Angeles. Yeah. They have churches that are very mm -hmm. welcoming and like, you know, they mm -hmm. ask for LGBT, you know, Q plus people right. to join and they're like mm -hmm. very uplifting and for everybody. Yeah. But, it's, but yeah. until the Southern Baptist Convention can come out and change everyone's mind and say, look, this was wrong. We were wrong. We are sorry. I don't think any of us in the LGBT community is going to feel very welcome at all. Right. And, and Michael, while, um, you know, you, you may not have studied Torah the way Lance knows the Bible, yeah. but uh, I heard you, you did have one hell of a bar mitzvah. Tell us a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I sure did. <laughs> he's still, he's still I heard, I heard the kids got in trouble. Yeah, he still oh, wears his B'nai Mitzvah shirt. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, still, I still wear it to the gym. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, that was a fun party. Um, yeah, kids got in trouble. You know, Wait, why did y'all get in trouble? 
I don't know. A lot of the parents thought we were dancing too provocatively. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was the, what is it? Year 2000. Yeah. The thong song was huge. I mean, at our dances, they would bring a <laughs> balloon around. And if you were, if a balloon couldn't fit in between you, then you're dancing way too close. And I remember because growing up, we didn't have many religions in the neighborhood. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it was either, you were either Baptist or you were Methodist. And you might have a few Catholics in town but no one would speak to them, right? So, but the, the Baptists, we would have these dances that we would go to, but Baptists can't dance. It is against the Bible yeah. somehow, but Methodists could. So we would always go to the Methodist dances and yeah, we would get down. <laughs> but yeah, I remember the bar mitzvah. Yeah, I mean, obviously bar mitzvah time, like if you grew up, you didn't grow up around. No, we, any didn't, have, Jewish... we didn't have any Jewish Actually, people in our town. You, oh, look, if my mom is oh, sorry, my, my B'nai Mitzvah shirt, Lauren Michael, it's somewhere up there. Oh, um, good morning, Mom. Hey, Mom. <laughs> hey, sister. Um, but yeah, I had my uh, my bar mitzvah, the Lagores Country Club, which like, you know, so many kids had it in Miami Beach. Um, that there. sounds fancy. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, I guess it was, but it's funny enough, but, you know, it was a, they used to not allow Jewish people to be part of it. Uh, the club wow. and then my grandpa actually built the Gorse Country Club and um, after he had built it he wasn't allowed to join it because wow. he was Jewish they distinctly wouldn't let him join um, and but it just shows how you know time changes and Miami Beach has become you know very Jewish now and I don't think it would have remained open if they didn't have Jewish people to join because it quickly turned to mostly Jewish at the Gorse Country Club after a while mm -hmm. um, so it just shows you how you know times have changed for sure especially uh yeah yeah i mean is there is there i mean probably not when you're when you're 13 but now looking back is, is there some satisfaction to saying you know they in a place where jews weren't allowed that my grandfather built for, first yeah. that you know that you were able to then celebrate your bar mitzvah there That's yeah great. i think there is i think uh it's great. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I wouldn't ever go step my foot back into there. But it's, you know, you can't have that attitude about everything because, you know, ultimately it's a building. And, um, you know, if you want to, you know, have our voices heard and integrated in the community and as, you know, so many groups want to, it's good to then take back those things that were taken away from you and show that you are just as justified to be a part of it as anybody else. Yeah. yeah. To make change, you can't run away. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. And now let's talk about the two of you. So, you know, we we definitely hear they're two very different upbringings. Um, yes. uh, but then when you met, uh, you obviously had a, a bunch in common. Uh, tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we yeah we come from very different uh, backgrounds for sure. And uh, that was the thing when we first uh, again when we when we first you know started dating and stuff neither of us were overtly religious. So it, that didn't really play much of a factor um, at all into it, but we did come from different backgrounds. So I just remember, you know, going to meet his family for the first time. And for me, like I've never really spent, uh, I'd never dated anybody with like a very religious family. And Lance's fa family is still religious. They're, you know, Southern Baptist. They are evangelical. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, but without being, they're not, yeah. Let's say they're evangelical. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Even Definitely. evangelical light, I would say. Um, they're open-minded and evangelical, yeah. um, which is great. Um, but I just remember I was nervous, quite frankly. I was nervous of going to Mississippi for the first time, just because I've always lived in a place where, you know, I'm Jewish and I'm gay and we're in places where it's been accepted for the most part. So I just, I just remember distinctly going to Mississippi the first time and being like, how is it going to be like me walking around with Lance, you know, in Mississippi as gay people? And, and it's like, this is the whole Jewish aspect of the family. It's like, oh, great. You're, you're bringing home your boyfriend to your religious family and he's Jewish. And I just, I, I was nervous to be quite honest. I didn't know how the family was going to be and whether I'd feel comfortable or not. And his family couldn't have been uh, nicer and more gracious to me. And, uh, and then I quickly kind of, cause I had my own stereotypical views of Southern, you know, from the South, religious people from the South. I, I've always, from my own, just seeing, you know, depictions on the news and TV, you see, you know, the extremists from everything. That's where I kind of, my mental mm -hmm. place went to the extreme. And I thought it would be like that, but it was amazing how so many of his friends and people in public were actually 
very nice to very nice to us and very welcoming. And that's one thing, like his family and the people where he comes from are very welcoming, welcoming, sweet people. They are guided by their religion in many ways, which, you know, it's their religion. And but it, it causes ignorance in a lot of ways to like the, the real world, as I mm-hmm. call it. Um, but I was very pleasantly surprised with how just sweet and welcoming everybody was. And they have just become such an amazing family and part of my family now. And yeah, I, I can't even um, realize like how, how I used to think about them to now is like a complete different world. Mm-hmm. What about you when you yeah, no, I, mean, <laughs> no, I agree? I mean, I was look, yeah. meeting your family who just came on the screen. Hi, mom. Um, yeah we uh it was just so easy with your family because you know at that point when i met you i i've just been surrounded by more open-minded liberal people um you know going back home you know i love all my family and my friends but there's certain things you just don't talk about you know you can't be your true true self when you're, you're hiding certain parts of your life um but with his family I just immediately felt welcomed and I could tell them anything. Um, <laughs> and I loved that. It was nice to have a, a liberal family, you know, since I've never had anyone liberal in my family. It was so nice to have family members now that were like minded as myself. Uh, Stephanie, Lauren, did the story check out? What do we think? <laughs> you right back. What was, it, what was it like for you when uh, me- meeting the families? Me meeting Lance's families? Yeah. Fabulous. It was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I talk I talk to Lance's mother all the time. We oh, have yeah. a great relationship. It's great. I mean, you cannot be more opposite of families, but somehow it just works. It's just so much love. Oh, someone was screaming, so we had to get her. This is Violet, everyone. <laughs> Say hi, Violet. Oh, hello. Oh, there's your baby, Lauren. <laughs> hello. <laughs> This one's a mini Lauren, by the way. My baby. <laughs> Hello. So, Hello. Speaking of family, perfect, perfect uh, opportunity to transition there. Um, now that your your parents, uh, how is your you know your view on on religion, on the community, on on how you want to raise uh, your children uh, has changed. Yeah, I mean, that is a good question. I think we're going to, you know, take it as it comes. I want them to be um, introduced and exposed to everything that this world has to offer. And that includes religion. Um, You know, I want them to be able to learn about all different types of everything and see what speaks to them, you know, what they're drawn to. So I will be very supportive of whatever they want to, you know, get into. Um, And it goes back to that kind of sense of community. Again, you know, I, you know, desperately would love to find a place that, you know, we had friends with kids kind of, you know, all together in some kind of great community that is, you know, revolved around the Jewish uh, uh, religion or the Christian religion, Um, because I think it really is just a beautiful thing to, you know, have that behind you and that support system. Yeah, and and we definitely want to, you know, raise them with you know, the main aspects of, again, of his Christianity and my Judaism, um, we want to expose them to both because, you know, they're, that they come from both of that now. And um, also just for ours, I mean, just for us alone, I feel like through them, I'm going to get back more in touch with, you know, my, my Jewish background, because I, I, you know, after, you know, a while when I went to college, I moved here, you know, I stopped, you know, I stopped going to the temple to, to the holidays. This is different when you live on your own, you no longer have that community, um, which I don't really have uh, that I, what was I used to have in Miami. And so just through like re kind of emerging myself into it through the lenses of these little babies. Um, I think it's just going to be great for all of us. Just kind of. Oh. All right, now he was crying. <laughs> just like us moment, you know, the baby cries, you have to go again. Yeah. Um, and we're doing this all without a nanny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm like that Chrissy Teigen, right? Um, <laughs> uh, the, so, uh, you know, we, we see uh, both kids there. You know, you did uh, for uh, your son, you had, you had a brisk, right? And at, at your wedding, I think you broke the, broke the glass, did that whole thing. How are these, these kind of decisions? I mean, is it just that's what we want to do or is it discussed like how do, how do you decide which of the things you do 
Well, to be honest, Lance was like the most excited to do. I'm the Jewish one. Traditions. Yeah, I love all the I love all traditions. He loves right? traditions. I mean, every holiday is my favorite. I love the Jewish traditions. So I'm the one in the family that makes it all happen. It's true. <laughs> every year. He was like, yes, we have to. What was that? Tell how many Christmas trees you put out. And we have a lot of Christmas trees. We have too. 42 Christmas trees. Is it 42? 42. Yeah. <laughs> so many. Yeah. So many. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> I I knew I wanted to do a bris just because I just I love the tradition of that because we knew we were going to circumcise anyway. So um, and then our doctor had a great moil. Um, he was like, Oh my gosh, this guy is so great. He'll just come to your house. Of course, it was in the pandemic. So uh, he came over and we thought, oh, it'd just be like this little short ceremony, but it was like full on, full on bris. Uh, we had family there, both of our parents, um, which I think traumatized them way more than it did us. Yeah, uh, I think it did too. <laughs> especially my Christian family who has never been to one before. So they're like, oh my gosh. And we had a random friend visiting too that did, it just kind of coincided. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, David Archuleta, who's oh, a yeah. singer. <laughs> Um, you might have heard of him. Sweet is, you know, he's Mormon. He just oh came out gosh. gay. The so, sweetest yeah. little guy. So David ever. Archuleta just comes out as gay. He's, you know, very Mormon and had a lot of, you know, struggles with, you know, his Mormon faith and being gay. He, I don't even know why he comes by. He's with a friend of ours. Yeah. Um, and, and then he comes right when we're trying to do the bris. So he had to watch the whole thing. And I think it traumatized him. I think it did too. Yeah. <laughs> his eyes were just <laughs> wide and he's like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, aside from traumatizing him with the bris, what, you know, what kind of advice did you give him in the, in, in, in the life scenario? I mean, you, you sort of experienced it first. Uh, did you, do you have any advice for him? Um, wait, for who? For, for David Archuleta? Yeah, uh, well, no, he was actually, you know, he was like taken aback by it all because uh, he's, he's never been to a bris, but he's, but he, uh, David was actually very like interested into other religions and like, again, their rituals and their things that they do. So he was actually like really amazed by the whole thing. He thought it was a beautiful thing. I think it was just when the actual, when, the, when it came down to the nitty gritty, he was like, oh, oh. <laughs> ah, I'm seeing yeah. it for the first time. Well, it's time. just so crazy how, like, I mean, you get rough with the babies during a breast. I mean, they're just like pulling them everywhere. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you think of my own it's scary yeah, yeah i know luckily you don't remember you don't remember yours <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so now now your parents i you know everyone always says you 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 turn into your parents right what, what do you see yourself saying things doing things acting certain ways yet that remind you of your your own childhood and your own parents <laughs> oh that's a good question i, I see you covering your face mom um uh well, at this, yeah, yeah, I mean, I get, well, I, at this point, we don't know what they were saying because we were this little. Yeah, uh, at this point, it'll be interesting when, you know, they're old enough to remember things and like what we remember as a kid, what our parents were saying to us and, you know, the different things in order to like, make us behave or, uh, you know, something like a little white lie to like get us to do something, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, but again, I think my parents didn't raise me strict at all. Um, and I think because of that, again, we were raised a bit differently. Um, I, my parents weren't very strict parents. I was never grounded. You know, I was never like forbidden to like go out with friends. I didn't have like the crazy early curfews or anything. And like, and I feel like we are, I mean, not, not like they can really get into any trouble right now, but um, we're kind of relating them in raising them in that way kind of just very relaxed giving them a lot of uh leeway and a lot of trust um but you know if they break the trust then you know then we can start getting stricter but i think for my own personal upbringing because my parents gave us so much leeway me and my sister we never had a need to like rebel and we always didn't want to upset our parents at all so like if you went out like my parents would let us out, uh, let us stay out late if we checked in. So we would always check in, you know. And my parents were never like, "Oh, if you, you know, in high school, guess what? You're, the kids are probably gonna go drink alcohol at a party." And my parents never instilled the fear in us, like, "Oh, if you, if I find out you get drunk, you're dead." Instead, from like the earliest age, they're like, "When you get older, if you ever, if if you find yourself in a scenario where you get drunk." 
that's fine. Just call me so we could pick you up so you'll be safe. And that's kind of the way I think we're going to do our parenting. Yeah, I just want to be as open, as honest as we can. So they could be honest with us and not yeah. everything is based on fear or getting in trouble. It's mm -hmm. on, you know, I'd rather than try to react on, you know, trying to just make us happy, make bring us mm -hmm. proud and that'll give them the, their own kind of sense yeah. of independence. And a lot of parents, you know, they think that, you know, sometimes kids are too young to learn things. And what we've learned is that's not the case. Like kids are smart, they get it. Uh, you know, my family, you know, for my niece and nephews, uh, they didn't tell them I was gay until I, I mean, know. we were together for five years. And they, and they still, uh, you know, and then finally, when they told her, they're like, yeah, we kind of know, like, are you kidding me? So they didn't think that they were you know, old enough to like understand, but of course they do. And yeah, like when I first came home to the first time they wanted you know me and we'll just stay in a completely different bedroom on a completely other end of the house and mm -hmm. I'm like to me that was like I, i'd never even you know but we weren't married yet you were married exactly but mm -hmm. for my upbringing it was never like a thing we're like oh of course we're adults we're dating mm -hmm. you know of course we can share in the same room mm -hmm. but you know there were more but again like i think just them being around me and you and just seeing how happy you are you know most of the time um, <laughs> um it, it changed i feel like their perceptions too and now they're fully supportive mm -hmm. and yeah and and his nieces and nephews you know who grew up grow or living in mississippi now growing up in the same scenario they they don't even it's nothing to them mm -hmm. like they're like oh you're gay okay yeah it's my i have a gay uncle and that's totally yeah. normal and fine mm -hmm. It's like, and, yeah. And, and, and it does feel like, you know, the, the world is moving in that right direction. Um, but there are so many, you know, especially here in Florida, there, there are the, the, the don't say gay law and, and other things that, that keep popping up. What, what, what can we do <laughs> about that? What are your thoughts? What we, how do we, how do we not take steps backwards as a community? I know. And it's just the way it works. You know, you go two steps forward, one step back. Um, you know, we just have to, you know, keep the fight and our community for some reason, uh, and the Jewish community just get attacked so much, um, just from pure hate. There is no reasoning, just pure hate. Um, and that's just something we're all going to have to deal with for a very long time, because for some reason, <laughs> people are just so upset with gay people. I don't know what we did to them, <laughs> um, for them to like, want to step into our lives and say, no. You can't get married. No, you can't have kids. Well, no, again, you can't adopt that person. And that's what it kind of goes back to the whole religious aspect because a lot of that hate is it comes from it yeah. comes from religion. Um, when they when they weaponize the Bible, you know, and misquote it, it's just it's really hard to take, you know, especially when it crosses over into our government, just like these bills that are being passed in several states. You know, in Mississippi today, if I go into a restaurant, you know, with my family. They could literally say we don't serve you, and they'd have to yeah. give me, an ambulance could come by. We call nine one one, and then I have a heart attack. They might not resuscitate me because they know that I'm gay, and they don't have to. They can just claim religious, you know, freedom. Um, it's those those laws that are being put in place that, that like I would hope no one would ever act absolutely. on that. Yeah. But the fact that there's a law saying they can. Yeah is just nuts to me and yes in florida you know if you even mention if our kids are in school and they mention that they have gay dads that could be a problem and if the teacher confirms that they can be fired um so you know we're always going to be under attack um the one lesson that i guess uh they have not learned is anytime that you come after our community it always goes the opposite way you're just going to make people love us even more <laughs> Absolutely. We're, we're going to take questions from the crowd soon. So, you know, uh, write in the chat some questions and we'll, we'll, we'll share them and ask. Um, but you mentioned one, one thing in there that you mentioned that I, I think is so true is, is that people are, are misinterpreting, right? They're, they're, they're using, they're using religion in the wrong way. Yes. Um, and, and, and that's the part, that's the part that always bothers me about, about that specific thing. It's it, because yeah. you can talk to plenty of people with, a completely different uh interpretation that that you know uh expresses you know harmony and community and love and all these acceptance of, of all sorts of things and yeah. and so 
you know, like to me that that's what bother, that bothers me the most um the, the, yeah because well, a lot of the time people they use religion as a weapon but mm -hmm. while ignoring the you know the dozen other things that they do that is explicitly says in their religion they're not supposed to do and i think a, like a, where a lot of like the the demonizing is placed on lgbt people because it's a good way to focus that negative attention on a smaller group and if you just say how bad it is it's bad it's bad all of a sudden that makes for some reason the things that they're doing seem less bad like a lesser of a sin even though all sins are created equal and so i think it's just become yes ma'am do you have something to say <laughs> very passionate about this um so yeah i think it's a lot of it's like look over there look over there to to kind of cherry pick that one out to put the attention on that be like oh well, i'm not that that's evil even though i'm doing x y and z and that's somehow worse because we've just said it so many times yeah. now that is bad and i think yeah, that's what happens look, homosexuality is never mentioned in the bible it just isn't it's been misinterpreted and added to the bible but it was never mentioned at all and if if it was that important, Jesus would have talked about it, right? <laughs> Since that is the, the creation of Christianity. Um, never said a word about it. I mean, there's more there's more uh, things written about people that are left-handed that are going to hell than homosexuality. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely going to hell. <laughs> um, let's see, the questions we have, we have one yeah. uh, They want to know more more of your wedding details. I know it's it's been a while now, but was there... Uh, what kind of what went down at this wedding? The first first dance, first what? What it was on TV, right? It was it was it was uh yeah the first televised uh gay marriage, which was uh, like really special to be a part of. Um, it was a beautiful night, you know. Originally, we thought, okay, just a small wedding. I'd love to be barefoot on a beach somewhere. I like that kind of stuff. But then when we uh you know agreed to do a special, we had to really kind of you know. We had to make sure that we represented our community well <laughs> with this with this over the top wedding. So we had our closest friends and our amazing family in this gorgeous place downtown LA, uh, the old Ritz Carlton, um, and it just felt it was just a magical night. You know, we we sprinkled in a lot of our traditions that you know we grew up with. Um, you know the uh, you know breaking the glass. I mean the first dance. Uh, we had my band member J.C. Chazay uh, sing our first dance, which was super special. Um, and you know, and a lot of a lot of people in that room have never, or well, one, never been to uh, a, a gay wedding before. Um, and a lot of them in the room never even really knew that many gay people. Uh, so to see everyone, you know, combined and just getting along and loving each other, it was just, it was a beautiful thing to see. Couple of drinks, everyone connects at the wedding, you know. Yes, well, a lot of drinks, yeah. Because I am from Mississippi, we did have moonshine, um, oh. which people don't realize how strong that is. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was something. <laughs> uh, another question is about your 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 everyday life. I know you're you're, you're busy with the kids now, um, uh, but any projects that either of you are working on things that things going on? Um, yeah, I mean, we have uh, just too many things going on right now. Now that the pandemic has started, you know, started to lift, work has really come back for entertainment. Um, you know, we were definitely the hardest hit uh, of all the, you know, all the businesses out there. Um, and everything went dormant for a couple of years. And uh, now that everything is coming back, all the projects are going now. So, you know, doing several TV shows that are coming out next year, a lot of films. Um, we're starting actually uh, a few lines together. We have a a baby clothing line coming out next year uh, because we're just inspired now by by kids. So we're doing all kinds of stuff like that and using his art because he's an artist. Uh, so we're using a lot of his original artwork for it. Um, and he has just started painting again because he took a little break since they were born and didn't have any time to pick up the brush. But just recently, he's uh, he started his commissions again. So he's he's back to work full time. I am. <laughs> And as far as parenting goes, what uh, uh, has anything surprised you about the, the parenting process so far? A lot yeah, of things. Lot. The different <laughs> milestones, you just don't realize. And we were so lucky the first you know, few months, we had a night nurse uh, staying with us that really taught us a lot of things. Like we did, I mean, look, two guys, we had no idea what we were doing at all. 
So we needed the help. And of yeah. course, family members there kind of walking us through everything. But I mean, just a lot of different surprises. Like, I mean, I don't want to get too graphic, but, uh, you know, uh, I did not know that little girls, you know, have their first menstruation within the first like two or three weeks. I'm like, wait, what? Like just little things like that, that you would just never have known or understood. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many things. Yeah. I had no idea. Mm. Like, I, I, I mean, I'd never changed a diaper until they came. So like, mm. I literally knew nothing. But it's am- I was just amazed at how quickly you pick up on everything. I mean, just the first two days we were in the hospital before we uh, went back mm. home. It was just a crash course, really. Yeah. And you do both, feel like an expert after 48 hours. Yeah. And so, like, when we came back to L.A., we kind of had a grasp on on a lot of things. Was I, you know, I thought I was just be, I'd be a permanent nervous wreck. I just assumed I'd be a nervous wreck forever, um, which I still am. But it's uh, way less stressful than I thought. It's still pretty stressful, but a little less. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's just cut to your mom really fast how do you think they're doing so far oh they're great yeah <laughs> you've, been, you've, been, you've visited a couple times right when i'm with them i am amazed how they are with these babies they are so relaxed they are they're just fantastic put put their faces close to the camera <laughs> <laughs> look at that um, <laughs> I'm very impressed how Michael and Lance are with uh, these babies. They're very hands-on and they're very good. I'm a nervous wreck when I'm around them. Yeah, you are. Michael and Lance are really chill. They're fantastic. And uh, someone actually, along those lines, someone asked a question. What, for each of you, what role has your, your knowing your in-laws played in the kind of parent that you are now? Oh, yeah. Wow. I mean, it's just a good mix uh, of our family. I mean, like I said before, the open mindedness and, you know, and being honest and open with them is what we'll take from, you know, the Turchins here. Um, And then I think, uh, you know, my my side of the family, the more conservative side is, you know, more of those like traditions that we grew up with. Yeah. His family is very big on just traditions and and celebrating together. They love always being together and they were just, you know um yeah just it's all about family for them you know like um they live in their small town and you know they don't have many friends but they have a big family and they and they're with their family all the time and there's something you know also great about that to have you know that you could just you know you have a huge family and they'll, they'll be there for you at all times so that's also it's great yeah yeah someone said they, they love uh all the Christmas trees, uh, but there's a request for a Hanukkah TikTok this year. If you uh, if you have it, oh idea. yes, we, are, we, we haven't do a done a Hanukkah one. TikTok. No, have we? well, it's gonna be fun no. next year. Um, I'm producing a movie, which everyone needs to read this book. It's called The Matzo Ball, um, and I'm oh, sure yeah. most people know what a matzo ball is. Um, so it's gonna be one of the first uh, uh, Jewish Christmas movies, which I'm super excited about because it's about a Jewish writer novelist that pretends that she is Christian and writes these Christmas books and that turns into Hallmark movies. So now she is, uh, she's gonna be pinning her first Hanukkah uh, holiday Christmas book. Um, and so we're, we're producing that uh, probably, it will, probably won't come out this Hanukkah, but the next Hanukkah. Yeah. All right, very cool. On, on that note, we're gonna ask you to stick around for the, uh, the, the after Zoom uh, for some of our... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I do, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you everyone, uh, uh, for joining for the, like I said, for those for the zoom after uh, stay on and you'll be, you'll be sent to a breakout room to continue the discussion over cocktails, um, uh, for students, uh, uh, I just want to plug some upcoming events all week. Next week, we're providing kosher food for Passover, um, uh, for, you know, any student on campus who needs, uh, there's a, there's a link where you can register for that. And next Tuesday, April 19th, we're hosting a Passover celebration with uh, the, Mi- the Miami Marlins at the game. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of Passover stuff. You can watch me throw the first pitch right into the dirt. That'll be fun, too. Uh, Olga has links. I think she's, she's putting in there for that. Um, and if I'm looking at my calendar, uh, today's April 12th, which, Bossy, what does that mean? 19 days, what happens? Oh, she got scared. Anyone else know what happens in 19 days? 
It's going to be May. Come on, everybody. You're supposed to know that. All right. Um, all right. Thanks for joining us. And those in the afternoon, after Zoom, we will see you shortly.